series is intended to feature Black intellectuals, filmmakers, artists. These artists, filmmakers, and scholars include DePaul alumni, who we are so proud of and are in prestigious graduate programs across the United States. The series could not be possible without the help of wonderful individuals. These include Ann Russo, Dr. Ann Russo from the Women's Center, along with Belinda Andrade, Haley Curtis, Amalia Salmiron, and Nina Wilson. From the Department of African and Black Diaspora Studies, Dr. Amor Coley, Catherine Douglas, and Shellen Beasley. And from the Center for Black Diaspora, Joel Daly, the Assistant Director of the Center, Catherine Douglas again, Jessica Williams, and Jennifer Ogumiki. So I will pass you over to Dr. Ann Russo, who will introduce Sarah Scriven. Um, Ann Russo is a professor in Women's and Gender Studies and also the director for the Women's Center. Ann, passing it over to you. Okay, welcome everyone. And thank you, Julie and the Center for all you have put into organizing this event. I am just so excited and honor, honored to introduce Sarah Scriven to you this evening, who just a few years ago was a very active and vital member of our, our uh, MA community in Women's and Gender Studies here at DePaul. Currently, Sarah Scriven is a PhD student at the University of Maryland, Harriet Tubman Department for Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies. Her research interests include Black women's studies, Black feminist intellectual history, feminist pedagogy, and visual culture. She earned her MA degree with distinction here in our very own Women's and Gender Studies Department, and she earned her BA from Duke University, also in Women's Studies, with a minor in African and African American Studies. Sarah's master's thesis at DePaul was really just amazing. It was a powerful, creative, and thought-provoking project that explored the life of 20th century civil rights activist and writer Polly Murray through archived portraiture. She offered a beautiful analysis through the lens of queer world making. She made my understanding of Polly Murray just expand exponentially in terms of, um, in terms of her life and work. This thesis was in part linked to earlier work of Sarah's before she came to DePaul, when she worked as a program coordinator at the Polly Murray Center for History and Social Justice in Durham, North Carolina, which I think really inspired her at that time to continue uh, learning and deepening her understanding of Polly Murray's contributions. And now it's connected with her current project that she's gonna share this evening. Sarah Scriven has been a leader in numerous organizations promoting gender and racial equity and identity. Uh, while at DePaul, she was the graduate assistant for Take Back the Halls, a teen dating violence prevention program in Chicago high schools. And she was a graduate assistant at DePaul's Women's Center. And I had the honor of being able to work closely with her uh, when I first came in as director of the center. We miss Sarah very much. She was such a vital part of our community. Sarah has also advocated for women's rights and global and local levels as a leader in the cities for um, a human rights campaign and has received numerous awards and scholarships for her commitment to education and social equity, including Duke University's Reginaldo Howard Memorial Scholarship, DePaul University's Ballinger Memorial Scholarship, and the Women NC North Carolina Fellowship. So we're so excited to welcome you back into our community this evening, Sarah, and we're eager to hear about your ongoing project on Polly Murray. Before I turn it over to you, I wanna invite all of you in the audience to listen. Um, as questions pop up or comments, please offer them in the chat. Direct questions should go to Joel Daly through the chat, uh, and then she'll offer those questions to Sarah at the end. So now please help me welcome Sarah Scriven uh, to our event this evening. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you for, thank you to Julie and Joel and everyone who organized this and invited me. I'm so grateful to be here. 
and so excited to talk about Polly Murray and share um, some of my thinking and be part of this series on Black feminist intellectuals. So thank you so much. And a lot of my friends are here from the program and the cohort, and I consider this whole community to really be um, friends to me. So I really am excited to be here and appreciate everyone who is here. So I will begin by sharing um, my screen and then I'm going to read a poem. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I'm reading this poem called Prophecy, which Polly Murray wrote in 1969. I sing of a new American, separate from all others, yet enlarged and diminished by all others. I am the child of kings and serfs, freemen and slaves, having neither superiors nor inferiors, progeny of all colors, all cultures, all systems, all beliefs. I have been enslaved, yet my spirit is unbound. I have been cast aside, but I sparkle in the darkness. I have been slain, but live on in the river of history. I seek no conquest, no power, no wealth, no revenge. I seek only discovery of the illimitable heights and depths of my own being. So back to my first Polly Murray memories when I was a junior in college, I learned about Polly Murray in a class entitled Civil and Human Rights in Durham. And Polly Murray was one of the key figures in that class because Polly Murray was a queer black woman from Durham, North Carolina, who went on to help found the National Organization for Women um, and whose legal scholarship was foundational to Brown versus Board of Education, which was the legal, which was the legislation that would um, that would outlaw segregation in public spaces and who was this incredible figure who was fighting for civil rights, for feminist civil rights very early on. So as early as 1940, Polly Murray, which we'll talk about more today was protesting um, segregated seating and buses, was protesting segregated seating at lunch counters um, in the 1940s. So 20 years ahead of when this would be a, really co a common practice for the civil rights movement. And so at this time, when I was exploring my own identity as a feminist and as a scholar, I really found so much of myself in Polly Murray and I couldn't believe I hadn't heard more about her. And so I was really excited to learn more. So I worked at the Polly Murray Center for History and Social Justice the year after I graduate, graduated. And this is a collaboration between Polly Murray's family members, between scholars, between community members who grew up in Polly Murray's neighborhood. This right here is Polly Murray's childhood home in Durham, North Carolina, um, that blue house that you see. And it was this community of people from all backgrounds, from all gender identities and races um, and ethnicities who wanted to uplift this public figure. And it was really exciting to think about. So Polly Murray's childhood home was named a National Historic Landmark. And this was, this was one of the very few, so one of the only ones um, for a black woman, for a queer person in, this, in the South and one of the very few nationally. And also one of the only sites that wasn't about um, battleground for a war or where kind of historic battle was won, but really a person who represented these values of, um, of social justice and equity. And so I kind of continued with Polly Murray by happenstance. When I was in my master's program, I read a piece by Francesca Royster entitled Queer Sounds and Eccentric Acts. And Royster is looking at these icons in the black communities who traffic these queer understandings of race and gender and sexuality. And though they're sometimes misunderstood, they're loved by their communities. And so while Royster was looking at these icons in music and pop culture, I thought so much about Polly Murray and how Murray was doing this through, um, through legal means, through poetry, 
being a lawyer, being a priest, being a scholar, a historian, the list goes on and on. So I, I continued to write and to think about Polly Murray from these new frameworks. So I'm going to set my timer just so that I stick to time. So I, I am having a really archive heavy presentation today because I, one of the really phenomenal things about Polly Murray is that she kept an immense, an immense archive, 141 boxes where everything that she, all the letters that she wrote to people, um, all of the drafts of the books, the poetry, photographs are all collected there. And I think it speaks to this larger practice of telling, of Polly telling Polly's story, um, of understanding that Polly's existence as, as a woman, as a queer person, um, as a gender non-conforming person, as a black person, all threatened to erase Murray's legacy from history. And so you have this really um, beautiful and articulate and um, fastidious and meticulous collection of notes. And what's especially impressive about this that my mentor Barbara Lau would always talk about is Polly Murray lived at more than 50 addresses. Um, and this is recorded because the FBI would, would track Polly Murray and kind of keep track of what was going on with her, where she was. And so even though Polly Murray moved partially because of economic constraints, jobs, school, activism, et cetera, she managed to pull these documents with her. So this, um, this first page is from a scrapbook that I'm looking at in my research. And it's a book entitled The Life and Times of an American Called Polly Murray. Um, born in Baltimore in 1910, lived to 85. This is that house that we saw that um, is being transformed in Durham as a community space that Polly Murray's grand, great, great grandfather, um, sorry, Polly Murray's grandfather built this home. And Polly Murray draws a lot of inspiration from family legacy and talks about her grandfather who was a union soldier who fought for the freedom of black people who were um, enslaved and talks about the ways that though African-Americans were being written out of history, really they stole themselves to freedom. Um, and her grandfather went on to found schools for freed black people. Polly Murray's grandmothers, sorry, Polly Murray's aunts who raised her, Polly Murray was orphaned at a young age. They, um, they Polly Murray calls them proto-feminists of being independent, of affirming Polly Murray and who Polly Murray was and of serving their community. And so a lot of my research is on how did Polly Murray get to be so awesome? And so there are so many threads to this and this family history is one of them, but Polly Murray also talks about this potential trans migration of souls um, where Tolstoy dies just the week after she was born. And is it possible that she got her her knack for nonviolence from that? Is it possible that her, her inclination for nonviolence comes from her father who was the victim of a, um, of a racial crime and who was murdered? And so, you know, kind of tracing these threads and also analyzing my own based on the context and political action that was going on, which we'll look at today. And if you look at this first picture that Polly Murray includes here, first and last up sweet hairdo. Polly Murray was, was gender non-conforming, um, often preferred masculine of center gender presentation. And so you kind of get this retort, but you also will see um, a larger series of Polly Murray pressing medical institutions to better understand what gender affirming um, medicine could look like. And I'll talk more about that later. So Polly Murray's legacy, I borrowed this article from Brittany Cooper, who deems Polly Murray, the black queer feminist erased from history, meet the most important legal scholar you've likely never heard of. So Polly Murray has so many accolades and achievements, and I'm gonna name just a few. So again, um, arrested in 1940 for refusing to move to the back of the bus, and this is 15 years before Rosa Parks will spark the um, bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama graduated at the top of her class at Howard um, University. And there, and there are some other, there's kind of um, some tension about when she coined the term, but 
Pauli Murray coined the term Jane Crow to refer to discrimination that happens to Black women that because of her experience in an all Black space where she was the only woman and she was being excluded from spaces where they were having private gatherings, talk about class material. And so Polly Murray says, it's not just Jim Crow that we're facing, but it's Jane Crow. There is this burden of sex discrimination, which is part of this long black feminist genealogy of naming the intersections of oppression. And another account of the term Jane Crow comes from this really, um, really great article by Simon Fisher, where Jane Crow, Polly Murray writes about Jane Crow in this science fiction essay as this bird that cites humans from up above, cites these humans having these weird problems of categorizing people as black and white. And then Jane Crow cites these people categorizing people as woman and man. And so Polly Murray contesting these, um, these categories and these binaries as part of the legacy of Polly Murray's intellectual history. She was the first black woman to get a PhD in juridical science from Yale Law School, named woman of the year in 1947. When we see what Polly Murray is doing on the civil rights front, her paper from law school was the legal strategy that won Brown versus Board of Education. So at the time that Polly Murray is in law school in the 1940s, uh, these civil rights lawyers who are the best of the best their strategy at the time is to argue for the equal side of separate but equal, to advocate for better accommodations and resources in these segregated spaces. But Polly Murray says, actually, under the Constitution, we are all we are all equal. And so segregation is fundamentally unconstitutional. At the time, it was laughable. They made a bet of $10. This would never win. And they paid her the $10. 10, 15 years later. So that's just kind of how Polly Murray is. And um, later she would author the state's law on race and color, which Thurgood Marshall called the Bible for the civil rights, for civil rights lawyers. So this group of Methodist women approached Polly Murray in the 50s and said, you know what, there are all these different laws. We can't keep track. We're trying to get some grasp of civil rights legislation. Can you do a pamphlet for us? And Polly Murray comes back with a multi-volume book that really helped civil rights lawyers at the time. Um, she co-founded the National Organization for Women in 1966 alongside Betty Friedan. And Polly Murray would later leave the organization because of conflicts around race and class politics, but they were there at the dinner table writing on napkins what their constitution for the organization would be. And she was the first African-American woman to be ordained a priest in the Protestant Episcopal Church in 1977 and was later elevated to sainthood. So I've, I've said a lot and I wanna reiterate why I think that Polly Murray is really important for thinking about women, gender and sexuality studies and black studies where many of us are intersecting today. And one, it's because of these diverse black feminist genealogies. So we, what Polly Murray teaches us, um, and in line with a lot of historians, is that there is no linear narrative to how feminism has formed within the U.S. and outside of it, how Black, um, how black politics have formed. And so Polly Murray, whose activism kind of reflects these different time periods, reminds us to look, to look in between, to understand how coalitions were forming and shifting um, throughout time. And one of my favorite stories that Brittany Cooper actually got from the archive and from interviews is that Polly Murray was a professor at Brandeis. And you'll just hear me say different jobs that Polly Murray had because she did so many things. So she's a professor at Brandeis and there was a student, the students were arguing for a black studies program. And one of their tactics was to do a takeover of the building. Polly Murray really didn't appreciate um, that, that sort of organizing. Another conflict was around what was the best language to, to use. So Polly Murray preferred the term Negro with the capital N. And the students thought that was really outdated. They preferred black with the capital B. And so Patricia Hill Collins is one of Polly Murray's students who storms out in protest. Um, and Hill Collins would go on to write Black Feminist Thought, a really important book for contemporary black feminism. And so by looking at these, these tensions, we see that it's not a monolith, black feminisms. 
And we can really kind of tease out what some of these differences are. The second one I wanna emphasize is the important work that Polly Murray does for the archive of queer and transgender life and politics. So throughout Polly Murray's life, the public writings don't have a lot of explicit language um, around Polly Murray's conception of, of being queer, of being gender nonconforming. And, but Polly Murray left this archive and directed people, directed biographers to go see the archive. The archive wasn't open until 2002. And that's when there's all of these documents, just lists and pages and decades of advocacy of Polly Murray and her friends and contemporaries clipping newspaper articles that um, are from international scholars and scientists who are thinking about hormone treatment of Polly Murray contesting the, the explanations that she's getting from doctors um, that are disparaging her gender and her sexuality and saying, actually, I think you need to run these tests on me. I think that I am a woman in a man's, in a man's body. I'm sorry, I am a man in a woman's body. And so Polly Murray would continue to advocate for herself, um, even, even with these painful, these painful explanations and erasures. Um, and these erasures and fear around Polly Murray's gender and sexuality are what Polly Murray suspected exclude her from many spaces with her contemporaries or from being written into history. And so having the archive told from Polly Murray's perspective um, is really both kind of a rich resource for ancestry and genealogy and for strategies around thinking about equality for trans people and gender nonconforming people and LGBTQ politics broadly. And so one of the examples that is really exciting is the Supreme Court ruling from summer 2020, which was the first time that the Supreme Court heard, um, took a case about transgender exclusion under the law. And this comes from one of the plaintiffs, Amy Stevens, was, is, was a trans woman. She actually passed about a year ago and she was, she was fired from her job, essentially fired. Um, they tried to like offer her money so that she wouldn't say anything. And the Supreme Court heard this case and said that on the basis of sex, you cannot fire a transgender person. And this, ar this argument had been used before for cisgender women and gender discrimination being really relegated to um, the experiences of cisgender women. But this was the first time that transgender identity was taken up by the Supreme Court. And what's really exciting is that they quoted the 1964 Civil Rights, um, Civil Rights Act and Polly Murray was essential. And you can, I can share her papers of arguing that sex should be retained. And so while people said, no, that's going to detract from progress with race or that's going to detract from a separate feminist agenda, Polly Murray knew that you couldn't separate these things. And so the article talks about, um, this article by um, Irene Cameron talks about Polly Murray's hand in this. And I do think about Polly Murray reaching from the grave to see the works that Polly Murray started. And I've also included Brown v. Board and Reed versus Reed. Ruth Bader Ginsburg names this as one of, names Polly Murray an honorary co-author because Polly Murray, she used Polly Murray's argument to argue that sex-based discrimination was illegal. And in this case, was unconstitutional. And in this case, it was a woman suing her ex-husband for the rights of their late son's um, estate. And the woman was arguing against this idea that she was unfit to be the executor because she was a woman. And while, while arguments around race had been using this, this justification of it's completely unconstitutional, RBG draws on Polly Murray's paper, names her in, in the document and says that actually we can use this for, for thinking about women's equality. So it's a really rich history of a person who has done all of this foundational thinking and when it comes to legal equality, whose legacy about human rights and Polly Murray says, I wanted to see 
America live up to its promise. And while that's often empty language, Polly Murray saw to it that that was fulfilled um, time and time again and throughout the decades. And then lastly, it's it's the theory and practice. Praxis. Like I said, Polly Murray has many careers and I'm gonna go into some examples of um, what it looks like to see Polly Murray in action by following some of Polly Murray's papers that think about these two important arrests that happen um, in her life. So, so in, in Polly Murray's later life, she's interviewed by Jenna Ray McNeil. And McNeil asks a question that I really wish I could ask Polly Murray too, and says, what is it that inspired you? Can you think about a moment from your early life, from the 30s, when you, that kind of foretells your tactics, your characteristics of activism that will come. And one of the, so McNeil talks about, was it your, was it your contestation of the, of being denied entrance to UNC? So Polly Murray applied to UNC to go there for graduate school in 1938 and was denied on the basis of race. It was completely ironic because Polly Murray was the descendant of both um, enslaved people and slave owners, and part of part of her her white and her white ancestors had given money to the school. But they, when they saw Polly Murray's application, added a box and said, "What's your race?" and denied her. Members of your race are not admitted. And Polly Murray would write to Franklin Delano Roosevelt and say, you argue that America is this liberal democracy, you're at the school, you're at UNC giving this talk, but you know I've been denied, you're denying, um, you're denying half the population. And what Polly Murray says was it wasn't, Polly Murray doesn't say it wasn't that, but what she does cite is her 1935 arrest. And so Polly Murray was part of the kind of intellectuals of Harlem at the time, and you have the Harlem Renaissance going on, you have the Great Depression, you have labor organizing kind of coming to a swell, um, interwar politics. And so Polly Murray attends Brookwood Labor College, which she talks to the interviewee, interviewer about. And she says that I was, she was part of this international and um, interracial organizing cohort that was studying these different tactics. They were studying sit down protests in Detroit where workers in the automobile industry were refusing to work. They were studying global movements. And Polly Murray talks about her first arrest, which was this really quick one in 1935, where with her friend Ted Poston, who's a labor organizer and journalist and part of this, um, this labor dispute between Amsterdam News, the leading black newspaper, in Harlem and the black employees for the right to unionize. Ted Poston says, Polly Murray, I need you to show up. Polly Murray arrives and holds, holds her picket sign, sings labor songs, is arrested and goes to jail and then is out within hours and returns to the picket line. And so Polly Murray says about this event, for all of my bravado, deeply ingrained notions of respectability, filled me with distress. It was one thing to ride freight trains anonymously or sleep in car or sleep in jails in strange towns where I was unknown. It was quite another to carry a picket sign in the heart of Harlem where people, where many people knew my name. And so, and I've included some images that Polly Murray saved from um, New York from 1935 to 1938. And so this was a, a really nurturing environment that Polly Murray talks about as inspiring a militancy from labor struggles that Polly Murray would apply to black struggle. Um, and not to mention Polly Murray already had a lot of these tactics. Polly Murray was leading um, reading and cultural clubs at her school at Hunter. Polly Murray talks about Hunter College, the all women's college as this feminist network and so there was a lot of organizing that was happening that would inspire Polly Murray. And like I said, there were other kind of moments that Polly Murray cited, her first protest being her granddad getting more stake than her and her arguing that that wasn't fair. 
but this is kind of the first one in the public space. So that for me helps to understand what happens in 1940 when Polly Murray is arrested on her way to Petersburg, Virginia with her companion, Mac, um, who's also an organizer. They are part of the Workers' Defense League and they are going home for Easter. And it's the two of them and they, this was not planned, which the biographers confirm. So they're going home for Easter and they're on a Greyhound bus and Mac is having some stomach issues and doesn't want to sit in the seat above the wheel. So there, that's the seat that's in the back of the bus and doesn't want to sit there. And so Polly Murray asked the driver, can we move up? The driver ignores them. They endure for a bit and then they move up to a seat that is ahead of the broken seat. There's a wheel seat, there's a broken seat, and then they move up. And what Polly Murray says is that, well, you know, we knew more black passengers were going to get on the bus. And so we didn't need to fill those seats. They would be full automatically. We wouldn't be contesting these racial lines. White people would have plenty of space in front of us. And Polly Murray is arrested, but this turns into an hour and a half long event because you have these two activists who are quoting constitutional law, who are telling them they're not afraid of the bullets and the shiny badges and you have um, and who know the laws who've been studying these things who weren't intending to protest this day but who've been preparing and thinking through what kind of strategies might lead to liberation and so Mac Polly Murray describes as being from West Indies and not having having very little tolerance for the way that Black people are treated and having no inclination to comply with those laws or be quiet about it. And we'll see, Polly Murray lays out the strategies that she was using at the time. We'll look at those letters. And so it turns into right this hour and a half long back and forth where the irritated bus driver is trying to get them to comply so that people can keep moving on, where the police don't really know if they're going to arrest or not. And so what they end up doing is fixing a seat and getting them a place to sit, which was still inadequate. The police leave the bus driver with a warrant for the arrest that the bus driver can use at any time. And, you know, it's almost settled and done. And then the bus driver gives these comment cards to all of the white passengers that allows them to record what happened. None of the black passengers receive the cards. And that's when Polly Murray gets very upset and says, um, you're acting like we don't exist and why didn't we get the card? So they're arrested and they're taken to prison. So what I really love about this, this portrait that Polly Murray creates in the scrapbook, you have the place where they were in prison and Polly Murray talks about the incident. They spent Easter there after having been arrested later after losing an appeal of the conviction, they refused to pay the fine and spent six days here. And she says this prison was used for civil war protest protester prisoners, sorry, in 1863 to 1865. And so I'm really interested, like I said, in these genealogies of resistance that Polly Murray is continually posing and standing proud in the legacy of her grandfather and of other people who've fought for black freedoms that are being um, that are being denied in this moment. So in this next series, I included three of the many documents that Polly Murray saved from this one incident. So, so this right here is one page from Polly Murray's scrapbook, The Life and Times of an American Called Polly Murray, which is a 72 page book with about 500 pictures. And some of them date back to 1863, but most are from Polly Murray's lifetime. Um, especially being in New York around the 30s and 40s. So there's just this one page that refers to the incident. It's, you know, well organized. It's got this title. It has the four pictures very neatly laid out. And then Polly Murray has another scrapbook, which I actually didn't, I didn't know until this year when I reached out to the archivist where her papers are held at Harvard to learn more about um, the life and time scrapbook. 
And the archivist said, oh, well, Polymary actually has this other one that we've digitized. And it's, it's more than 200 pages and it's only about this, this incident on the bus. So I included just three because of self-control, even though all of them are really exciting. So this first one is Polly Murray's letter to Walter, Walter White, the secretary of the NAACP. And Polly Murray is, this is March 29th, 1940. So this is less than a week after she's been arrested. Um, they stayed in jail for six days. So it might kind of just align with that timing of getting out of jail, but it's right around that time. And it kind of has Polly Murray's spin and, and eloquence. And one of the things, one of Polly Murray's strategies that she learned from her early days, early 1930s, she called confrontation by typewriter, where she would write letters to people telling them what she thought and why they were wrong and what they needed to do. And so this kind of has that, that edge to it, but she's also working with them. So Polly Murray has not been to law school yet, but she does tell them exactly what issues they need to focus on in her case. And she says that one, the driver's responsibility for the comfort and convenience of all passengers. Two, the fact that the Virginia segregation laws include no section stating that Negroes must fill up from the back of the bus and that this is probably only a policy adopted by bus companies in the Jim Crow states. And finally, the practice of segregation laws does not live up to the interpretation of separate but equal. And that hardships and inconveniences are worked upon Negro passengers in the attempt to carry out segregation law. Also, that human rights involving illness of passengers, et cetera, are above the strict legal interpretation of the law. So where Polly Murray got the time to do this while she was in jail, dealing with bed bugs, dealing with being threatened by um, the people who were, who were the prison guards because she was also having some issues with them. Um, she's, she's getting this letter together to send to her lawyers. And what's really rich and Polly Murray esque is this final note that says, we note that the state of Mississippi is trying to introduce a measure providing partitions in the interstate buses, providing equal but separate facilities for, for the two races. Perhaps our case has the making of a test case in it. And so from the moment that Polly Murray and Mac knew that they were being arrested, they fully intended to take this to the Supreme Court. They said on the bus, and then Polly Murray writes this in her account, and the eyewitness states this as well, that you can arrest us, but we will appeal this case and we will take this to the Supreme Court. So you also have Polly Murray's strategy notes. And on the left, you have a, a chart that shows where everyone was seating. You can see where the W represents where the white people were, C for colored people, which seats were vac vacant, plaintiffs here. Um, so you have this diagram and she's sending all of these copious notes to her lawyers, a full description um, of the event facts and times and details so that she can argue her case um, through them. She needs her help, but she also relies on her own, her own understanding of the law, her own um, theories about liberation to argue here. And you also have these notes that she's taking a chart that compares nonviolence in India and for the American Negro. And this is something that will be really popular. We, many of us have heard about Martin Luther King um, using nonviolent protests, being inspired by Gandhi, being inspired by the fight against British colonial rule um, to use these tactics. But as early as the 1920s, um, groups of Black people were taking trips to India to learn about these practices and see if it would fit with the fight against Jim Crow in the U.S. So Polly Murray is also taking notes about that. Murray writes to her activist friends, and I don't know if you can zoom at all, but she talks about using these principles 
of Saudi Gagara, the, um, the nonviolent protest. And she lets them know what's happened and that they've, they've given it a try. So let's see if I can read from here the point that I want to bring us to. Okay, so she says um, right here in point number two that her plan, well, one, the plan was not to be arrested, but they did. And on the spot, we applied what we knew of Saudi Agara. And she also goes on to say on the second page um, that they're also using these tactics within the prison to appeal to the prison guards to receive better treatment because they don't have beds, they don't have towels, they're being harassed by prisoners in the prison. They're very uncomfortable in these gendered spaces. Um, Polly Murray and Mac decide to build coalition with these people who were harassing them in prison and say, actually, we have a lot in common. And maybe you should join the NAACP and you know, tell us what you need because they write a letter to the prison guards and they request the following in accordance with the rules for prisoners, which Polly Murray must have spotted that request what they, what they desire. Um, a sheet, a towel, soap, books. You know, I love that Polly Murray just wants books. She's also asked for photographs and in other instances. And so this tactic that she uses when it comes to the medical industry, when it comes to writing to presidents, is no different from what she's doing here in the prison by ap applying these principles of nonviolent protests, which include, um, which include in this case, cordial communication is I think one of the principles that she talks about and, and appealing to human rights and to what is equitable. And so, right, so this is March 24th. So they've only been, a, they've, they've been there for a day. And so this is a copy of the original that she typed because they did take her typewriter, but they found time to make this. She thanks them very kindly for your kindness and courtesy thus far. So a little bit about how this ends. So Polly Murray was really disappointed when, disappointed and unsurprised when the charge for her being, her being arrested was not defying segregation law, but it was, um, it was civil, civil disorder, civil disobedience. Um, and so Polly Murray is, is disappointed because she wants to take this case. She wants to appeal and go to the Supreme Court and challenge the segregation laws. So that's not gonna happen. Another disappointment from the trial is that her lawyers wouldn't appeal the charge of disorderly conduct. Sorry, that was a charge, disorderly conduct. And they wouldn't appeal because Polly Murray is also sending notes that say, actually, what qualifies as disorderly conduct? We didn't do anything that would be disorderly. And they appeal it once, the judge upholds that, and then they, the NAACP doesn't appeal it again. One of Polly Murray's suspicions and a painful, a painful reality of this is that she believes that the lawyers um, don't want to take up her case because she's not the right kind of victim. And she thinks about how her queerness is playing into that. And there was an eyewitness account on the bus. So this was like the perfect storm in some ways of, of an encounter with Jim Crow laws of a white sociology student, a man who recorded the incident and was publishing about it who was fabricating details and who did say disparaging thing about Polly Murray and about Murray's appearance and voice and stature and um, ambiguous identity as a black person and writes about Polly Murray as a man. This man was with this woman, Mac. Everyone loved the woman, we were cheering for her, but this man was really rubbing us the wrong way. And Polly Murray writes to her aunt saying that this is the devil's work that um, to have this disparaging account and not because of how he's identified her. Um, well, that's part of it because then she fears that the NAACP 
won't take up her case, that they won't um, support someone who's gender nonconforming, who won't look the way that someone thinks someone should look for, to be a sympathetic um, victim of these incidents. And so Polly Murray, but it's not so much about Polly Murray being described as a man because Polly Murray describes Murray herself as a man throughout, um, especially this early part of her life and also records and documents, even in her autobiography, this public work about people having different perceptions of her race and gender and really using that to undercut the idea of these strict and um, easy categories and identifications and to take pride in, in her own gender. And so that was a sore spot for Polly Murray, but the story does not end there. So there were so many moments like this um, where people were, were fighting these Jim Crow laws in many places and buses was one of them. And so the, the case that actually went to the Supreme Court was Morgan versus Virginia, Irene Morgan in 1946. And that was a successful case where they, from there did outlaw segregation on interstate travel. And it wasn't actually about, it wasn't actually about racial equity, but about laws around commerce and kind of the complications that that would have for buses. But anyway, people take this up and they use that and they're chanting, like, you can't make us move because um, Morgan won her case. So we won't move on these buses. And so then in 1947, Byron Rustin, um, who's a prominent black civil rights activist um, and a gay man, creates this coalition in New York and says, let's, let's put this law to the test which we know is the case that when something passes as a law, it often takes time for it to actually be enforced and for people to recognize it. And so they organize these freedom writers, they call it the journey of reconciliation, where they're going to, they select a cohort of black and white men. And this really pissed Polly Murray and other organizers off. Ella Baker was part of this coalition. And they decided that they didn't want to include women because they didn't want to have any sort of suspicions about, um, about any kind of sexual politics that might upset, upset these places where they were going where, and there were real concerns about mob violence. And so they selectively picked places in the South where they would test this out. And so they did have these, um, these freedom rides where they rode on the buses together strategically in pairs in the front of the bus in the back of the bus. And they were penalized for this. Um, Byron Rustin spent 30 days on a chain gang and they were so, so were things reconciled, not in this moment, but it did set the stage for activism that would come for, um, for Rosa Parks, for, for Claudette Colvin, who would come right before Rosa Parks, but also not be taken up with the NAACP when they found out that she was pregnant, although she was in a similar situation protesting segregation. So yeah, so that is the story. And that is the end of my presentation. Thanks so much for listening. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk more about Polly Murray and answer any questions that you all have. Thanks, Sarah. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you. All right, so we will immediately go to questions. Um, just be informed that anyone who wants to ask questions can just direct them to me via the chat. While we're waiting for the questions to come through, um, can you stop sharing things? I wanted to ask um, you, can you talk a little more about the Harvard um, archive um, and the collection it holds for Holly Murray? Yes, so, so that is, 
That's the biggest archive of the Polly Murray collection. And it's about 141 boxes and 60 feet in linear space. So it is really big and it has, it has correspondence. It has um, several scrapbooks. I've seen these two. I've seen videos of Polly Murray referencing other scrapbooks that I imagine are the other ones that are in there. It has video. Um, it has the letters to the doctors that I was talking about, drafts of Polly Murray's book, collected articles. Um, yeah, so there's a lot there. And a lot of it is digitized, not a lot of it, a good amount of stuff is digitized, um, interviews, audio files. And so, yeah, it's open to the public and I can share a link yes, to please. the finding aid. Yeah, because I really wanted to, my dream was that we would do this in an archive, but we're here doing what we can do. So mm -hmm. I'll share the link so that people can check it out. Um, and it's really a great, it's a great experience. Patricia Bell Scott talks about taking 20 years to write the biography about Polly Murray and her relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt because it's just such an immense collection. Right. So uh, pretty much what um, I, I'll, I'll sneak in before others. So pretty much what you're telling us is that Polly Murray was, she was archiving her own life and experiences and work for racial justice. Um, she was doing that already. Nobody did right. this. She was, she doing, was that. doing that. Right. She was doing that and she would be kicked out of apartments for always typing so loudly on her typewriter. And she just kept these really meticulous records. Yeah. All right, so I will think we might have questions now. Yes, we do. We have a question. It says, uh, let me, do you um, have, this is from Ann Russo, do you have a sense of a community of friends and comrades she was connected to while also doing the organizing and her legal work and more? Yes, so one of the really exciting artifacts that came to the Polly Murray Center was this address book that was Polly Murray address book that was going to be thrown away or someone just found it. And so we did this project of communally archiving it where we had volunteers come and take 15 names and write everything they could find about them. And some were really obvious like Coretta Scott King, Eleanor Roosevelt, Bayard Rustin, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and some were like Polly Murray's hairstylist who was really influential. Um, Polly Murray's friends and family. Um, so that's one glimpse, but also Maida Springer, um, who was a labor rights activist, was Polly Murray's close friend. Polly Murray's romantic relationships played a large role in her life. And she writes about those in her autobiography. Um, so with Peggy Holmes, who is someone she meets at one of these camps for, for women that Eleanor Roosevelt creates during the Great Depression, and her lifetime partner, Irene Barlow, whose death inspired Polly Murray to go into um, the Episcopal Church, and also her family relationship. So her Aunt Pauline, they were very close, um, their letters are really sweet where she calls her like motherkins and polykins. She confide, they confide a lot in one another. They disagree on a lot of things. Her, her aunt is really in fear of the repercussions of this activism, but encourages Polly Murray and always has to, to kind of be an individual and stand up for self. So I think that, and even Polly Murray's connection to ancestors is really and vital to her to her practice with the scrapbooks and talking about spending hours in the room looking at these photographs of people who she couldn't who she couldn't meet but who inspired her and yeah so she made a lot of different friends but those are some of the ones that stand out 
Okay, thank you for responding to that. There's another question that says, could you discuss more of Murray's impact on the LGBTQ plus community during the counterculture period? How much influence did her work have on events such as Stonewall? So Polly Murray did not, as far as I know, directly um, engage a lot of the LGBTQ Q movements that were happening while she was living. And um, so, right. And in some ways, Polly Murray, and mostly privately in letters to doctors, distance herself um, from, from the politics of the time. And so I can't say much about her engagement with um, countercultural movements or even Stonewall because I don't know of anything that's been documented on that. Um, and how I do and how a lot of scholars have read Polly Murray's investment in queer world making is through a lot of the subtext of her arguments. And so, um, and so even these stories of of kind of family reconciliation and love after slavery and even subtexts of writing about herself are the ways into understanding Polly Murray's queer politics um, rather, than, rather than activism on some of those fronts. Thanks, Sarah. And um, there's a question in the chat. Was Polly Murray's insistence of Negro with a capital N due to a generational difference from her students or did she have a certain reasoning? She had a certain reasoning and um, she talks about first encountering that term Negro with a capital N in college and that feeling more dignified to the lowercase n and always always preferring that term. Um, and for infighting professors or feeling, feeling dishonored when they would use a lowercase. And so part of her tension with students was, well, we fought to have this uppercase in Negro. And it isn't this derogatory term. This is the dignified way that, that speaks to um, Black people's status that we fought for. And, but there was another term that um, younger generations were using and preferred. Yeah, I have, there's another question here about how difficult was it for Murray to be in tune with her faith, despite conflicts she endured between her gender and sexual identity and respectability politics, especially in the Black church? Um, that is something, that is something that she talked about and Right, this idea that one of my favorite Polly Murray stories that really inspired me when I was young and thinking about faith and myself was she got married for this really brief time, which she calls a dreadful mistake in her autobiography to this man. I think his name was Billy and it lasted a very short period. And she talked about how um, young women of her time didn't have sex before marriage. That was not respectable. That was not the Christian thing to do. And so, and so they got married and kind of has this assumption that maybe it was because they wanted to do what was respectable and it was this mistake. And so in that sense, she is talking about respectability and sexuality um, quite explicitly in that example. It does come up in some of the private correspondence, but I can't think of the exact examples right now. Um, and then when she gets to the church, that's actually a lot of when, um, a lot of where she can make these arguments about, about gender and about kind of queer queerness and about, you know, under God, there is no man and no woman. And a lot of scholars read that as as queer theorizing. She also did some really early womanist theology, blending feminist theology and black liberation theology. So in many ways it reconciled that for her, 
when she did get to the Episcopal church and she talked about um, enjoying being called, not having a title like miss or mister because they didn't have that within the Episcopal tradition um, and enjoying being called father. And so, so some, so in some ways there were tensions and in some ways it seemed like one of the ultimate places of reconciliation um, in some accounts. Yes, and to Oh, you broke up. Can you, can you tell us more about that? What prompted her? Perhaps. Uh, Polymer to do so. I'm sorry. You're breaking I up. I can't hear I... you. Okay. Hello? Hello? Hello. I can hear you now. I am so sorry. Um, it's okay. Sometimes I was just saying that there. Someone asked the question about um, Polly Murray was being was ordained as a priest. Can you tell us more about that? Maybe what prompted it and so forth. Um. So, so like I said, her partner Irene Barlow. They. They were Episcopalians and that was something that they shared in common. They met at a law firm where Polly Murray was working where Rini was a secretary, that's what she would call her. And, um, and they, and Polly Murray's life, the way she talks about it changed a lot after that moment. And they spent a lot of time together or corresponding when they were apart. And the church was one place where they connected. Um, and, and so, I think that was part of it. And I actually went to a conference recently at Union Seminary where they were talking about Polly Murray's call to the ministry and how it wasn't really a phase at the end of life, but this long kind of spiritual journey that she talks about um, throughout her life and autobiography. So there's this moment where this, this, this preacher says something to her, like, I know you have this calling on your life. And she talks about how that really affirms her. She talks about hearing the church bells. Um, someone offered this really nice queer reading of this rainbow that suddenly appears once Polly Murray is ordained and that being Polly Murray's affirmation um, about her place in the church. So she talks about it. She includes images in that scrapbook she wrote to where she's collecting things from the arrest she writes to the vicar of one of these churches and you get the letter back from him. And he's like, I'm really sorry you're going through that. Like not a lot of sympathy. Um, and so, but she did have these people as part of her network and leverage that um, like even writing to FDR being like, we're both Episcopalians and you how, how can you call yourself a Christian and do these kinds of things. So even before she was a priest, she was thinking through those things. And it, it's so funny because I'm also, I remember it was a huge thing when the first Episcopal woman priest was ordained, right? I think like in the 70s. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, she protested that. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's like a lot of protests. There were walkouts that happened. There was like the first conference that Polly Murray and others protested. Yeah. Um, I have a question um, that came to my chat and it said, uh, it says, I was wondering about any connections you've made with Polly Murray and the work and teachings of Dr. Anna Julia Cooper. Um, I can't, I know that there's, I don't remember. So I know that there's one there's one letter where Polly Murray does um, does cite the black women leaders that have come before her, like Harriet Tubman and Mary Church Terrell, who was a mentor to Polly Murray, and um, they connected in New York through um, through the NACW. And so I would think maybe Anna Julia Cooper was part of that list. But no, I haven't, I haven't thought, I haven't like seen their connections, but I have thought about their challenges to institutionalized 
racism and racist violence. And um, Sarah, there's somebody who's curious to know if there's a database that has been created easily to access her scrapbooks and documents. Yes, so I will put this, um, I'll put this in the chat to everyone and I'll put the two scrapbooks that I have access to that are digitized. Well, if I send it to you, Joelle, can you send it? Cause I can't send to everybody. Oh wait, maybe I can. Uh, you should be able to, cause I made you a co-host, but if not, I'm happy to. to... Okay. Me, I can post it to everyone. Oh, there it is. Yep, it showed mm -hmm. up. I'm sure seeing it. Okay, and I'm going to send um, links that will take you directly there. Can I get a thumbs up if everybody can see it? Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like... Um, Let's see, for some reason the screen just, my chat just disappeared on me um, when okay. I clicked on that link, let's see. Okay, so um, maybe- Does I'll... anybody have any additional questions? Okay, I'm, um, I'm seeing some uh, uh Let's see, I have, I have one here. Um, Sarah, how did you first learn about Polly Murray? And why did you choose to focus on her for your dissertation? I learned about Polly Murray when I took a class, um, a, a class called Civil Rights and Human Rights Activism in Durham. And I'm losing my screen. And so I, I was just really enamored and I was at a, it was at a time when I was thinking about what it meant to be a black feminist and feeling like, hmm, are these things incompatible um, sort of racial equity or faith or feminism? And I saw an example that no, they weren't and that there's a long history of a lot of, um, a lot of feminists that challenge this singular narrative about what feminism means or racial equity means. And so I just really liked Polly Murray and I liked the people because it was part of this community that was, um, that was up holding her legacy. And so I just met so many people who were, who were really great and inviting and nurturing and had, you know, who like lived their lives in the spirit of Polly Murray. So it was a really great environment. And then, and then it's because of Julie, because then I wrote about Polly Murray, my master's in a class, in Anne's class based on Francesca Royster's book, sounding like a no-no, um, because then I had more language to think about um, black queer genders. And then when I was TAing for Julie's class on black feminisms, we met and she was like, I wanna include this person, Polly Murray, like what, do you know anything? And I had known stuff, so I was really excited and um, and really loved the class and loved talking about Polly Murray, and yeah, so that's how I did it. And this is a great follow up question: Were you taking your research now, or what questions are you asking currently that you hope to use in developing your dissertation? Where I'm taking my research now, I'm thinking through. I'm thinking about Polly Murray's photography, but visual politics largely and, and how Polly Murray was maybe doing this visual theorizing. And so I read this book about W.E.B. Du Bois and these data portraits that he created for the World's Fair um, around 1900 and how he was organizing things in this like data visualization process um, and so I thought about Polly Murray and the way that she's organized all of her photographs, how she collected these photographs. Maybe she's taken some, maybe some were taken of her and what, what visuality means because she also talks about it. She talks about um, the experience of her blind grandfather and 
how he didn't see these these symbols of racism, recognizing that he experienced them in other ways, um, and how the violence of these looks or being invisible. And so I'm doing some research around that and looking at the scrapbook and hope that I can go to the archive soon and see more of them. Thank you for, and I apologize for the beeping horn at my window, but I have one last question here um, from, from, from Francesca who says, what is, what is one of the biggest lessons you've taken away from Murray and how do you apply her to everyday life? Was that for you, but did you hear that or? I did, uh, that's a good sure and hard question. Um, I would say, I would say love. And it's funny because Francesca was on my committee and I wrote my thesis. And one thing I'll always remember, she was like, Sarah, this is like a story about self-love. And in many ways, I think that Polly Murray represents that um, self-love, falling in love, um, even being in Polly Murray's paper, like writing to her exes. I mean, I think just like follow love and find it and fight for it. And the kind that is radical and transformative um, and fun and pleasurable and thrilling and exciting and silly. So that's my favorite Polly Murray lesson. And then the next question, what does Sarah, she says, what does Sarah plan to do next in her exciting, beautiful career? Um, I don't know. It's hard to, I'm so happy to be back here with you all because PhD life is really hard and stressful. So I'm just trying to get through it and keep writing and find different words and ways of thinking about things. And, and yeah, and then I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. That's the last question. That was the last question. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank Sarah so much. I, I am. Yeah, we're so proud of you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm looking. Um, I have one more link to send for okay. a scrapbook. Perfect. While you're sending that, let me talk a little. Um, Sarah was our first speaker in the series, the Emerging Scholar and Creative Series, um, co-organized by the Department of African and Black Diaspora Studies, the Women's Center, and the Center for Black Diaspora. So I really thank you for this, Sarah. We'll follow up on May 6th with an evening with artists Zakia Najiba Dumas O'Neill. That will be the same time, 6 to 7.30. And we'll drop, yes, the Eventbrite links are being dropped in as I speak. And then on May 18th, Jennifer Gardner and Isayi Akinyela um, talks will be, if not for pleasure, then at least for the principal championing, championing pleasure in contemporary hip hop. And um, Isayi Akinyela will talk about hashtag real black girls, an examination of hip hop, hip hop and black womanism. Um, on May 25th, we will have a discussion, screening this and discussion of black feminism and its relevance to theory, culture and art with Maya Sinclair. And um, there'll be viewing of a film, a black feminist uh, film. And then uh, Maya will talk about that film and show clips from it. So these are our events that we're having that's coming up and I welcome you to attend them. Uh, one final thing, can you please fill out our survey? There should be a survey link that will be dropped in the chat. And after that, if does anybody have anything else that they'd like to say? Or, okay. Yeah. Yes. I'll just say um, thank you so much, Sarah. This was such a, just a powerful presentation. And I feel like each time I listen to you talk about her, I, I just learn so much more. And um, so many new questions arise. And, you know, you've, you've, you've made her, I don't know, just, just such a, a narrow view of her. You've just really made it 
grow wider and wider. I mean, she is just amazing and very inspiring. You know, um, what she was doing, what she was thinking, how she contributed, all the ways that she was connected to so many different movements and ways of thinking. So thank you so much. It's so great to have you back at DePaul. Always miss you. Always, you're, you were such a, you're such an important part of the community. Yes. So, yes. Before we go, before we go, Jasmine Rush has her hand up. And um, Jasmine, would you like to ask a question? Oh, okay, we'll unmute you. Thank you. I just wanted to say, Sarah, this was absolutely like amazing. It was so wonderful, so informative. Um, when we read earlier for class, the blurbs about Pauli Murray was kind of like, like, they were very small, like we didn't read a lot. And so this just really opened my eyes. And I'm just so grateful to know more of who she is now and to have her introduced as such a force. And I also wanted to say, I've been thinking so much about the ways that Black women are made to feel invisible and even just like of course then black trans women and black gender non-conforming people are made to feel invisible and so many times that is rooted in actual erasure of records and mm -hmm. for her to scrapbook and really create this archive of her life is incredibly inspiring and something that i mean if 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 the account is there people will come up with if it's if, if the account is not there people will come up with with whatever narrative about who you were and she didn't allow that to happen and that's just so cool so thank you for bringing all of this to um yeah to us today thank you thank you so much thank you so much that was really kind and thanks julie and ann and joelle this is really exciting and i also learn a lot more every time I get to present and talk about Polly Murray and go down my own exciting rabbit holes. So I really enjoy it. And thank you so much. Jasmine, thanks for that incisive commentary. Very nice. Um, mm -hmm. All right then, well, everybody, good evening and thanks so much for attending. Take care. Don't forget to fill out the surveys. I'll stay behind a little, uh, Sarah. Hi, Chelsea. I can see your face. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> oh, wait, can you unmute yourselves? I'm sorry. Hold on. I'll unmute you all. <laughs> oh, hi, Beth. I didn't see you. It's so good to see you. Now I'm sad that we're not in person. See if you can unmute. And Heather. So can you? Yeah, okay. Hello, Sarah. Oh, I'm so glad I stayed. I thought you could see me. It's so great to see you. What a beautiful presentation. Thank you. It's so good to see you too. I know, I know. Oh, and there's and Heather. Hey, Heather. I'm unmuting everybody. Don't worry. <laughs> I know. I remember one of, I think one of those first pictures you showed in our methods class. I remembered one of those early pictures and you talking about when you first started learning about Polly Murray. So it's just like to see the way you've expanded this scholarship is spectacular. Thank you. Yeah, that was, a um, yeah, I wrote my paper on like approaches to Polly Murray's queerness right. in that class, a literature review. That's been really helpful, so. Yeah, I miss it. Hey, Charles. Hi, friend. I love you. I learn so I much you every too. time you, you share about Polly Murray. I feel so fortunate to know and love you. Thanks, love. <laughs> That's why we need to do an Anzal Du and Polly Murray collaboration. Ha <laughs> ha, there we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> and hey, Heather, it's good to see you. Hi, Sarah. Oh, it, it, this was lovely. And thank you for your work. And I was really just sort of thinking a little bit on, like you said, taking a little break from the PhD life, right? To come back into the arms of people who yes. care and support you like so much. Not that there aren't people there who do that, but you know, it's such a different feeling. So it's lovely to have this. 
and mm-hmm. just to see what you're continuing to do with this work you're clearly like yeah. impacting and touching people's lives and your perspectives and takes on Murray coming out of the work that you started at DePaul and with your faculty mentors like the way you've been it's just amazing and exciting to see I think there's like so much more here that you're going to be doing so thank you thanks Heather yes and hang in there because like you're going to get that get that PhD right they're going to give it to you okay (laughs) from your from your mouth to God's ear yes absolutely right (laughs) yes yeah thanks yes so it's so all right I'm going to ring off but I'm so glad to have stayed to say hello and just so (laughs) delighted to see you so good to see you Beth bye good night right one more question so when do when do we think you might be done with the dissertation research it, it'll be probably two to three years two to three more years okay I two just to three more years okay okay mm-hmm. yep so on the way on the way but we'll stay in touch <laughs> so we'll stay we'll keep tracking your progress yes yes mm-hmm. yes and I will be in touch with you, Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Thanks for inviting me and organizing this. You're welcome.